Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, spending this spooky Friday the 13th <laughs> evening with us. Um, my name is Amali, and I'm the events director here at Books Are Magic. We are so excited to get rolling with tonight's event, but before we truly get into it, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. Um, out of courtesy for our authors tonight, masks are required, and I see that everyone is wearing one, so I don't need to continue with that one. Uh, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Shannon will be around to sign and personalize your books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube, on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Company Online using the link in the live stream description. All right, now it is my pleasure to introduce Shannon Sanders and Tony Tuatamuni, who join us tonight to celebrate the launch of Shannon's debut short story collection, Company, which... <laughs> which, over the course of 13 stories and roughly half a century, follows the generations of the Collins family as they grow together and apart, relocate and return, and endure everything that comes their way. Shannon Sanders lives and works near Washington, D.C. Her fiction has appeared in One Story, Electric Literature, Joyland, Triquarterly, and elsewhere. And she was a 2020 winner of the Penn Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize for Emerging Writers. As I mentioned earlier, Tony Tuatamuri joins Shannon in conversation tonight. Tony is the author of the affordable novel, Private Citizens, and his novel, Rejection, will be out next year. He teaches the writing class Crit in Crown Heights, and you can apply at crit.works. Okay, that is all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Shannon and Tony. Thank you so much. Hi, Tony. Hello. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Okay, awesome. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I am going to start by reading just briefly from a story in the collection called The Opal Cleft. And I'm going to read this one because it is, although not set in Brooklyn, a story that kind of implicates Brooklyn. There's a lot of uh, Brooklyn legacy in it. And also because Tony was one of my wonderful teachers, he actually workshopped this story with me in the very early stages. So um, I'm really excited to share part of it in its final form and to acknowledge how much he's given to this book. So here is the beginning of The Opal Cleft. Here was Cyrus at the door on a Saturday, unannounced and with a leather duffel hanging from each arm, asking to crash for a night or two, three at absolute most. In the half year since Theo had last seen his cousin, Cy had perfected the all-over look of bohemian tragedy, down ten pounds he couldn't afford, a premeditated shabbiness to his winter coat, and his hair tied back with a shoelace. He had shows coming up in D.C. neighborhoods Theo recognized vaguely by name. At the last minute, his Airbnb had fallen through, and then his phone had died on the way there. So thank God you were home, he finished, breathless. Is it okay? Sure, said Theo. He stepped aside, flooded with gratitude as Cy entered the apartment. Saturdays now meant cleaning, a relentless litany of tasks that required rubber gloves and had to be done well for the subsequent Sunday to be worth a damn. A distraction was welcome. He peeled the gloves from his hands and took one of Cy's duffels, deposited it near the sofa. Cy looked around, his eyes widening at the folded afghan on the sofa, the framed photos lining the bookshelves. Look at you, Mr. Lives with a Woman. Is she home? Should you ask first? It was a smart question, but Theo bristled anyway. She's at brunch, he said. I'll text and make sure. Though, of course, the answer would be a thirsty-ass yes, Aja long having hoped to meet this particular cousin of Theo's. Thanks to YouTube, she was a super fan, one of those 25 to 34-year-old women whom Sai found charming at his shows except when he didn't, who drank too much on empty stomachs and tipped stupidly well, but got their low-hanging earrings snagged in his good wigs when he agreed to photos. Theo wondered whether to say so, to manage expectations. But Sai had already plugged in his dead phone and installed himself in the just-scrubbed bathroom, where he now spilled the contents of a vinyl makeup bag across the sink. 
If it helps, he called, I can get you guys tickets to one of the shows. Tonight's sold out, but probably for tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday. Oh, and thank you, he trilled in a voice Theo recognized from their roommate days when he'd half-watched dozens of these metamorphoses on Sai's show nights. In the early stages of transformation, Sai basked in the playfulness of it, trying on ever campier personae as, inc as incrementally his face disappeared behind the makeup. But another eight layers of paint or so, and he would no longer be Sai, but heaven, azure shimmer everywhere, highlighter dappling her cheekbones, and her speaking voice would follow suit, a languid contralto like a cloud floating majestically past, or so it had been explained to Theo. And that was to say nothing of what happened when whichever wig went on the inexplicable shoes, Sai already stood even taller than Theo, a willowy six foot four, the extra height inherited from the towering Danes on the other side of his family tree. Heaven on heels was a spectacle. Aja would lose her mind on Tuesday. Aja, any time, said Theo, and leaned in close to inspect the surface of the stovetop, clean as far as he could tell. That was awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I have to disclaim up front, um, you know, it, technically, yes, I, I taught a class uh, that Shannon was in, but I didn't really do shit to these stories. <laughs> you know, it's definitely one of those situations where uh, I, a student shows up and I read their stories and I'm pretending to teach them, but really I'm like, well, how'd you do that? <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, I, I think for the people in this room who have not, uh, you know, read the book yet, um, I was wondering if you wanted to describe, you know, what the book is about for, you know, the layperson. Thank you for those lovely, those lovely untrue compliments. Um, <laughs> but sure, so Company is a collection of 13 linked short stories, and they follow the members of a multi-generational African-American family in cities along the East Coast, especially the D.C. area. Uh, and each story, as the, as the, uh, the title kind of suggests, involves a moment where a guest interacts with a host. So either someone is receiving company or someone is company to someone else, which I think in the stories kind of teases out these sort of performance anxieties and conflicts and old tensions among the members of this family. Yeah, now the first thing that you see when you open up the book is uh, this sprawling family tree at the beginning. And uh, it's the biggest, most complicated family tree you will see this side of Russia. Um, but, uh, you know, I was wondering though, like, because it is, you know, a collection of stories, um, where did you start? I mean, is it the situation where you kind of envisioned the entire family at once or did it kind of go piecemeal? It was kind of piecemeal until I got a little bit of momentum. So there is a really short story in the collection. It's called Rule Number One. Um, it's kind of almost a nod to Jamaica Kincaid's girl. So, uh, the, sort of the concept of a mother interacting with her daughter and just relentlessly imbuing in her these rules for, for what a girl should do to be a good girl or a good woman. Um, and so that story kind of lays out these rules that a mother is passing on to her daughter, which is kind of like one of the recurring themes, I think, in the story of like legacies of performance. Um, so that's one of the first things I wrote. I was pretty new to writing fiction as such at the time. And then I kind of took a stab at writing a piece of more, something a little bit more substantive. So the very first story in the book is one called The Good Good Men. Uh, and that is the first story that follows more of a traditional arc, I think. Um, and then I kind of found that, so I have like a, I have a, a history in fan fiction. And, and so I, I feel like I was kind of used to the idea of taking existing material or characters I knew really well and then building on them using the material that was already there that I did not have to worry about. So just kind of adding plot or layering, you know, tension or whatever in detail. So I just kind of started writing other stories that picked up on characters from previous stories who had not been fully explored. And then all of a sudden I had like six or eight of those ready to ready to link together. So it's almost like this kind of carousel where like the background just becomes the foreground in a different story. Yeah, totally. Yep, exactly. Um, I, I mean, that point about fan fiction, that is r becoming increasingly common. As like a teacher, I feel like 30% of my students like came up through like Wattpad or fanfiction.net. <laughs> Anyone relate? Anyone here? Yeah. See some nodding heads. Um, MFA versus NYC versus Wattpad. There you um, go. <laughs> versus AO3. Um, um, so yeah, you know, uh, uh, I was curious about the form of the, of the book because I think a lot of people 
you know, instinctively when they're like, it's about a family, it's, uh, you know, they're connected, so I would write a novel about it. But here I think this is like one of the few sort of uh, linked story collections that I'm like, I this really has to be a linked story collection. I can't imagine it going all, you know, all the way to the kind of edges of like, oh, this is like the sort of, you know, nephew's girlfriend's story or something like that in, in a novel and having it hang together. Um, so, you know, how did you sort of come across the, the form? When did you decide that it was going to definitely be this form and not something more conventional like a, like a novel? I think I was partly stubborn because, of course, when you're in a writing workshop and you're workshopping short stories, r always you get asked, well, sh couldn't this be a novel? I feel like I want more. This should be a novel. Is this the beginning of a novel? And so on. Um, but I'm a huge lover of short stories. I'm, I'm very inspired by, you know, ZZ Packer and Daniel Evans. And I'm my old teacher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. ZZ Packer, your old teacher. Yep, exactly. And I um, I just find something really satisfying about the idea of taking like a little nut of an idea, something that is maybe small, seemingly small, and then just building it into a world of itself and then having that like satisfying feeling of just, you know, kind of like sealing it off when you're done. So I was really enjoying writing short stories. And even though I did have the thought of, well, should I just keep going instead of linking these short stories? Should I just make them? Should I try to, you know, find some tissue to make them into a full work of fi fiction? I eventually felt like I was getting so much more out of that kind of kaleidoscopic approach and being able to jump away and look at someone else or something else for a minute. Yeah, the, the tough thing about writing stories like that, though, is that like, I feel like you can go on forever, right? A every story could lead to another story potentially. So where do you draw the boundaries around that? Like, how do you know when you're done with a project like that? Okay, in my case, it was because I had like three kids in a period of three <laughs> years and my writing time all of a sudden really um, became a lot more precious. And I had what felt like a really good skeleton of a collection by that point. So I had maybe six or eight stories that linked together and I felt like sketched out this really cool picture by themselves, but I could see that there were gaps in it. There were things I wanted to explore. And um, once I connected with my agent, Reiko, and we kind of talked about what we thought the collection could benefit from, I had a little bit more focus. And then it was more about like plugging holes. Um, and at some point, I felt like I had touched on every member of the family in that family tree whose story I really wanted or needed to tell. Um, and then it was kind of just like adding icing to the cake. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I could I could definitely go back and I could plumb a lot more out of the the characters I didn't explore. But I, I ended up being pretty happy with kind of the form it took. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, of course, that uh, you you know have three kids and it, two of them were on the way when you were in my class. Yeah. Right. So the deadline was really impending there. Um, and on top of that, you're an attorney. Right. So. I, I think that, like, you know, a lot of people would naturally wonder about this, like, how, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, like, I, I don't do anything. My life is completely empty, and I, I, it took me a lot longer to write my first book. Um, I don't know what you guys' excuses are. I see some of my students here. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? Uh, so, you know, I, do you want to talk? I mean, you wrote an essay recently uh, talking about kind of writing on purchase time. Can you sort of talk a little bit more about you know, that process? Yeah, for sure. I could say so many millions of things about the topic of, of what it's like to write with kids versus writing without kids. But I mean, you know, in in fairness, most of the material was written before I had three kids. So two of them are twins, by the way. Um, and time, of course, becomes a lot more precious. But I think that some of it has to do with, well, there's a couple of things. So number one is I took your workshop while I was expecting the twins. That was a really overwhelming time for me and for everyone because it was sort of early pandemic. It was really tough to um, to carve out space because, you know, didn't have childcare, had to work a full time job, all of that stuff. But yeah, we're talking about like July 2020, July like, 2020. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think that consciously seeking out structure and deadlines and a community, all of those things are really helpful. Um, writing is a lot of the time a really solitary, really lonely process. And having people either excited to see your work or expecting to see your work is a, is a big motivator, at least for me. Um, so I took, I took that workshop. That was great because it gave me some structure and it gave me a reason to be excited to work um, and also to feel like I, I owed it to someone to do it. 
And the other thing is kind of being okay with there being cycles of what you are capable of doing. So fallow periods where there is a lot going on at home and where maybe instead of generating material, you're revising or submitting or thinking about, you know, like planning your next thing. And then other periods where maybe the kids are sleeping through the night like this week and you can actually set aside some time to get some words on paper. Now, I want to go back to what you said about the kind of, um, you know, theme of legacies uh, in this family. I feel like every family, especially like a, a fictional one, tends to have a sort of collective character to it. Um, how would you describe this family? Like, what are they like? Yeah, okay. Well, this is a, it's a multi-generational family and really it is focused on three generations. So a, a matriarch and patriarch who are entrepreneurs, their children who through like kind of the what they have built as entrepreneurs are able to go get educated and become academics, professionals, uh, you know, musicians in one case. Um, and then the children of those children who are millennials, who are doing what a lot of millennials do, which is, you know, flail or <laughs> <laughs> try not to own property. Exactly. Not o not own their homes. <laughs> try to either replicate what they liked about what their parents did or in some cases like run screaming in the other direction. Um, but I think that uh, among the legacies that this family kind of has passed down and shares and like a lot of, I think, black families in East Coast cities where there is a lot of, um, you know, where there are class expectations and in some cases like prejudgments and stuff that we face that we want to make sure we stay on top of, like performance anxiety, you know, concerns of respectability politics, fear about being perceived in a certain way and wanting to control whatever that perception is. All of those are things that I think we see in this family. Yeah. Now, that's a really big one for me that uh, I felt like reading through it, I felt like there was almost these two aisles of, of types of people in, in the family. And one was like somebody who is very type A. They have their stuff together. They're rule followers. They sort of like, you know, are achievers. And then uh, there's the other side, which is like the opposite, right? They just kind of don't have their stuff together. They have not sort of lived up to the pressure that of, of, of their family or whatever. And weirdly, the two sort of sides kind of like feel the same way about each other, which is like resentment, <laughs> right? You know, and it, it, I feel like it has a lot to do with like just sort of class and, you know, in, in one sense and another, just like the sort of ordinary family dynamics of, you know, older, younger sibling type stuff. So I want to talk to about... Um, the story, uh, uh, Bird of Paradise. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, in my reading, I, I feel like the backbone of this huge family are these four sisters, uh, the, the, the four daughters of the patriarch and matriarch. Uh, and the oldest is a woman named Cassandra who becomes, uh, is just sort of like, you know, wins an election for to become provost of at her college. And uh, the story takes place at uh, the sort of, you know, reception welcoming party as provost. But she's getting nothing but shit from everybody uh, at this uh, party. And she's also wearing uh, a dress that is like very carefully calculated to look like a statement piece, but not, you know, uh, paying it, you know, drawing attention to parts of her body and things like that. So she's like so, you know, uh, in her head and obsessed with her appearances there. Um, and then, you know, she brings her. Uh, nieces along to, to look like, you know, she's got family uh, to sort of cut a certain image, but they are not reflecting Hunter very well. And I feel like it's, it's, it's just like a great example of how like, you know, when someone's close to you, like it's not all just kind of, you know, fondness and intimacy, but like just their being close to you makes them reflect on you. Yeah. And so if they look bad, you look bad or whatever, and you kind of hate them for that. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, the sort of what the thinking that went into this story and uh, the sort of, you know, uh, the, the family and the professional spheres overlapping in that story and things like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that really hits the nail on the head that when you have family or when you have people who are representing you, there there is just so much inherent t tension is that in that, which is why that's kind of the nucleus of so many of the stories really is the idea that the older generation is expecting or wanting something from the younger generation. And in, in every case, the stakes feel very high for them because this is going to end up being a reflection they feel on their parenting or on the legacy that they have created. Um, but then meanwhile, these millennials either wanting to live their lives or 
having a statement of their own that they want to make in some cases. Um, Removing the modesty panel from the dress that she selected for them. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Pulling out the modesty panel because her goal is not to look chaste and academic. Her goal is to look, you know, cute and slutty or whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's just so much inherent tension, even just, even in a family where there is not that kind of um, performance expectation in what the t what the generations want that is so different and in so many cases diametrically opposite or even uh, set to collide with each other. Um, and yeah, I feel like it's really interesting to explore that in a family tree because so often there the stakes feel so high. So why do you think that this family in particular, I mean, I think that most people can relate to in some way. It's just like, oh, my dad's embarrassing me or something like that. But like here, I feel like it's like, you know, dialed up to a level and I was wondering, you know, what is it about this family, the character of this family that, that makes them so image conscious like that? So there is, and this is kind of explored in the stories, there is this suggestion that their grandparents who would have been entrepreneurs in sort of the just post-segregation Atlantic City in the 1960s, um, that they were able to achieve some amount of success because of their ability to get along and to look a certain a certain way and to project like a certain um a certain class or a certain willingness to behave in certain ways and but they worked in like a jazz club they did they worked in a jazz club and then they ultimately were able to buy a jazz club because whatever they did you know worked um or the, i guess that depends on who you ask the story as as kind of unfolds throughout the book but some of the lessons that they would have learned and some of the some of the values that they would have taken from those experiences just don't translate well or translate differently in later, more integrated generations. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, th there's actually a sequel to this story. It's a sort of surprise when you keep on reading through the story. You know, it ends what, what seems like very decisively. And then all of a sudden, there's another story later on where you're like, oh, it's like the same scene, but from the vantage of, of the nieces who were at the same party. Um, and you find out in that story that, like, it's possible that this family mythology of the grandmother or grandfather, you know, buying this jazz club might uh, have more to it than it seems. And what I love about that is that it's actually never resolved, like one way or another. Like, uh, it, you know, there's different sections of the family that believe different things about it. And that sort of um, ends up sort of uh, defining their place within the family in a way. Um, you know, speaking of, of, of uh, you know, caring about appearances, I mean, I feel like the exact opposite of this character, Cassandra, is um, her sister, Leela. So Leela is a real hot mess. Um, and she uh, is kind of sort of derided. I mean, she's sort of like the, the butt of every joke in, in the family. And the joke is that, like, she's constantly throwing herself at men, codependent on men, um, you know, making herself sort of the, the victim of men who are very openly exploiting her and stuff. And there's not one but two stories where different characters and p people in the family are intervening in her relationships to, uh, you know, try to be like, this guy is no good for you. We need to, like, make this decision on your behalf. And that, that's a kind of, like, a really, another really characteristic thing of this family, that it's like there's this stridency to act on behalf of somebody else for their own good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it, they're right and sometimes they're not, you know, or, or the question is, I think, a little open, right, about who you're supposed to think is in the right. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, in writing this this sort of like, you know, almost opposite character to Cassandra, yeah, were, were you thinking about like, uh, you know, her as the kind of like failed, uh, <laughs> you know, member of the family or sort of the flailing one or, or what? I actually, so that's interesting because there are, like you said, there's four sisters. Two of them we get really close to in in the stories that are told. We get to really get close to their perspectives and... They're both point of view characters in at least one story. And then the other two, I kind of intentionally did not get that close to them. And part of that is because I, I kind of like the questions that are left open about what do we make of a person who in a family people infantilize or people have low expectations of and, and then, you know, decide to intervene on that person's behalf. And so you mentioned there are two stories where there are people uh, around Leela who are really on, they're not confident in her ability to to make the best decisions for herself. But I think it's really interesting to let a reader take that journey along with them and kind of make decisions about 
whether that's appropriate or, you know, even if it is appropriate, should people be doing that to an adult? If it's not appropriate, you know, are their hearts in the right place anyway? Um, and then furthermore, kind of, especially in a family like this one where there are kind of those performance anxieties and also those like respectability concerns and worries, is it a good thing to have a community that will rally around you and be there to pick up the pieces when you when you break and when you fall and when you break, uh, regardless of whether it seems like it is intrusive? Yeah, I mean, in one of those stories, it's not uh, it's it's her own sons that are doing the intervening, whatever. Where it's just like you would usually think that you know uh, uh, she would have the upper hand or the agency in that kind of relationship, and yeah. she definitely doesn't, right? Um, so. Um, you know, a third sister is uh, a character named Suzette. She's also, you know, not a character that we inhabit. Uh, and that's partly because she's dead uh, for, you know, uh, in part of the timeline of, of the book. Um, she's sort of like Cassandra in that, like, she um, is has it very together. Uh, but she's almost regarded, I think, as kind of like a little Miss Perfect uh, in the family. That she's, you know, we mentioned that story rule number one earlier. And she's the mother who is sort of constantly issuing these like rules and all of them are rule number one uh, to her daughter uh, about you know how to act and how to comport themselves and stuff. And then she just sort of vanishes, right? Um, and it's what, it, what I found really interesting is that like sh um, her death is not, is, is only alluded to. It's never, there's no scene where you see the, the you know, process of deterioration or, or death from illness. Um, and, you know, what, what was the decision there to just be like, you know, I just want it to be this kind of matter of fact in the universe and not like a dramatic point uh, in the book? Yeah, I, I think that that's another character. So, you know, like, like you said, she's not really ever given um, the protagonist role. We don't get to be very close to her. And I do find that in real life, we really mythologize people who are absent and it's so much easier to say, oh, Suzette would have handled this perfectly. You know, I can't because I'm actually facing it. But she would have. She would have known the right thing to say and the right thing to do. And I think that there, you can really see a lot of interesting things about a person based on what they project onto someone who is absent. You know, in some cases, that might be a lost parent or a lost sibling. Um, but yeah, I my feeling there was that I wanted that character to be more of a projection of sort of the anxieties of the family and in that way almost not a real character in herself. Yeah, right. I mean, In that sense that she's almost trying to project an idealized vis version of herself to the world. That ideal is the thing that kind of lingers around on Earth after she sort of passes, right? Um, and we actually see an even more literal version of this in a, in a different story, uh, which is uh, company, the title story, right? Uh, and this is a story that's about um, the fourth sister, uh, Felice or Faye. Um, and she is, you know, the one who has inherited uh, her mother and father's house. Uh, it was sort of, uh, you know, agreed upon in the family as a kind of pitying gift uh, to her because she doesn't have a husband or kids or a successful job. She's just sort of a kind of sounds like sort of mid-tier painter or something. Uh, and she, she, there's a great line where she's just like, oh yeah, because I have, you know, I can live rent free. I don't have to sell any work. And it's just like, oh man. <laughs> um, but you know, she shares this house with the ghost of her father. Right. And it's never, you know, I, I think that it's e equally easy to read the story as it just being a kind of metaphor or a psychological projection, uh, from that character, or it could be a real ghost. Right. Uh, and there's almost e e there's even a teasing moment where um, when she gets a visit from her niece, uh, her niece, you know, repeats a line that uh, her father likes to 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 to, to say. I, I'm gonna go have a talk with Granddad or something. Um, but it turns out just to be a euphemism for drinking, yeah. right? Um, so uh, yeah, you, do you want to talk about um, this sort of? How once again you have a, a a sister that is the opposite of all the other sisters, and you know what what Felice's role in the sort of grand scheme of things is. Yeah, I I like so there's four sisters, and I feel like that happens a lot in literature. You there's so many examples of families of four daughters in books that we read, and I think part of the reason is because you know parents produce children and in some ways the children are projections of what the parents have tried to do uh, or the, what they have tried to create and put out into the world 
But no one person can be everything that their parents want them to be, obviously. And so in literature, I think authors really often try to show uh, some, in some way, like a spectrum, everything that the parents have created. So the good and the bad, you know, and so you might get a sister who is the best of what her parents have tried to put together. And then a sister who shows like what kind of the, the backlash can be to that same kind of upbringing. Uh, and so I guess here I have created like a sort of Joe Marsh um, in in that she's kind of like she's not exactly what was created, but she is definitely a byproduct of that kind of like foot in your ass upbringing where people have such high expectations of you. Um, but so that story and, and you called it sort of a ghost story and it kind of is one. Um, there are a couple of stories in the book that bend the rules of reality a little bit, and that is a good one. But I think that with almost every ghost story, you see that for the most part, every ghost is a projection. It is some, uh, it is in some form, whatever the character's understanding of what people who are gone would have wanted or would have said or would have done. Um, and I feel like in the case of Faye, we get the most honest look at what the parents were really like, because she is the, the one who is least bound by the expectations and by sort of the... Uh, that performance legacy. Yeah, and it's it's almost uh, there's a metaphor for that in the story where she's like the only one who uh, her father would like clink glasses with when he was drinking. Yeah. Uh, that there's this kind of like sort of understanding or camaraderie, adult understanding between them. Um, so you know, yeah, I, I feel like that is you know a good sort of you know representative sample of the book. But I also want to give a little bit of you know thought to. The kind of interesting satellite stories, like uh, Rioja, for example, uh, where I think this is one of uh, Cassandra's kids, right? Yep. Uh, it's yep. Cecilia. Um, but it's not about uh, the Collins family, uh, like most of the stories are. It's it's about her uh, trying to assimilate into her husband's family, right? Or, or partners. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. That's sorry. That's significant. Yeah, her uh, her boyfriend's uh, family. Uh, after, you know, and, and this guy has had you know, many exes, two of them named Linda. Uh, and so she's got sort of a, a, a lot of sort of, a, you know, a baggage and a lot of things to sort of live up to. So, you know, um, how did you think of this, this sort of story about a, 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 someone from the Collins family trying to assimilate into a different family fitting into this whole sort of design? Yeah. So there's a few stories that depart from that Collins family, like that central family tree. But I do think that in a certain slice of the black community, especially on the East Coast and especially in certain cities, there are themes that we see echoing through everyone's experience that we that we definitely really find in our peers too, which is that feeling that, you know, we share kind of like some of these cultural markers, um, churchy relatives, relatives who have like certain expectations about what we're gonna do with respect to marriage and children and, and career. Uh, and then even though we have that commonality of understanding, in some cases, when people start to pair off, you see that they will do things that really significantly depart from the expectations. So again, a little bit of that collision between the generations. Um, but I, yeah, I really enjoyed, like you said, there is a member of the Collins family who is a part of that story, but she is not really the central character. She's not the point of view character. And I liked having the chance to give a little bit of uh, a vision to what that family looks like from the outside mm -hmm. to someone who is there to judge them and has a little bit more of an objective look on what they're doing. Yeah, and they fuck with her a lot. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> the whole family is kind of complicit in it. Um, um, so yeah, you know, I wanted to turn things over to questions uh, soon, but I had one more uh, question, which is, you know, I'm not going to ask you if any of the characters in the book are based on people you know? C certainly not anybody in this room. Certainly not. Um, we're on YouTube. Um, yeah. But uh, I will ask that, like, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a novel about family. I think the, the, the natural thing is, you know, what's my family going to think? Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know how, how does my life you know, my, my own family relate to the family in this in this book. So whatever you want to uh, share on that topic without narking on yourself, yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in hearing. 
Okay, so I'm going to keep saying this until I just keel over from saying it. No, <laughs> everyone in this book is a work of fiction. No one is a real person. Good, good. Um, Always uh, deny it. Always deny it. Never, yeah. never, <laughs> never, never say something is based on someone real. They, yes, uh, yeah. And students of Tony, you're going to find that if your character has a mom, your mom is going to assume that it's her. Correct. Um, and that's across the board. Even if there are 12 mothers in the book, they're all her. Yeah. Um, so, but of course, you know, I mean, like writers definitely... What, what we know really well is the thing we're going to be able to give the most life to. I'm, sh I'm sure that that's going to be true for almost everyone. And I think it's a lot of fun to, especially in unexpected places, to see little things of people that we know in a character that they maybe will not explicitly identify with. So uh, I have a couple of family members here and they kind of like know who they are in the book or who they are, so to speak. But of course, the the scenarios are are ones that they have never experienced and they're things where I can only imagine and invent what I think they might behave like if it were to happen. Um, I had a friend in workshop who also really liked to say um, that when she would read a story, she liked to always try to locate the writer in the story. She would always try to find like that one little character who peeks in and does something that you can tell is like giving voice to the writer's opinion that they just cannot hold back. And I would say that more than they are anyone that I know, I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, almost every character in the book has like a, a little splinter of something that I would love to express to the world or whatever, or that I feel could have been my destiny had I only just done this other thing. Um, yeah. But at the same time, like a big part of writing fiction, I, th I think the appeal of it is that it is this kind of demure black box where it's just like, it could be me, it might not be, yeah. you don't know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, even if I told you it was me or whatever, I w you know, I'm dead. The author is dead, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what, is, what does that matter? Um, a, a little, you know, fun fact is that uh, if any of you, uh, you know, remember the, the bad art friend kidney gate debacle, um, that that resolved itself today. Uh, the, the the verdict was uh, a draw. They both lost their suits. So like, the defamation suit and the countersuit both knew. Gasp. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So okay. you heard it here first. <laughs> That's a Friday the 13th uh, miracle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we can turn over for questions now. Uh, uh, I, uh, my only request is don't be weird. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Seconded. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's Hannah. Oh, hi. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say, you know, congratulations. And I know how hard it is to make your first book come out. I feel like that's like the biggest mountain, you know, of any writer. And so just congrats. I know how much work you put into it. Yay. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Thank the, so you. the question yeah. was <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. As you launch into your journey. Well, okay, so first of all, I have to, like, of course, thank Hannah and every person in the One Story family for everything that they have done to, to be a part of this. So one of the stories in the book, the very last story, The Everest Society, was published in One Story. I got to work with Hannah and others in getting that in, into the world, and just uh, One Story is so amazing. Um, the most exciting thing about this truly has been getting text messages from friends who have finally read the book and have actual feelings about the stories and are, are you know, sincerely reacting to them. Because um, again, like so much of the writing is so exceedingly solitary. There's so much time spent with literally no one even having a clue what these things are that you're thinking about all the time. And it is really super exciting to be able to finally dialogue about some of it. Other questions? So which character are you in the book? <laughs> um, uh, the guy with the shaved side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is about voice. Like, you know, you talk about voice, we talk about voice together a lot. You do have a very full life, obviously, and you have for a long time. You have a full-time job, you have children, you have a husband, you have like so much to manage and so much noise. How have you been able to like hold on to what is distinctly yours in your voice without losing it over the I guess how many years that you've been writing this book? Yeah. Like seven. Yeah. 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 How? So the question is, you know, uh, you have extremely full, busy, thriving life. 
how do you hang on to you know the, this project or sort of protect it uh, sort of from uh, outside intervention, I guess? That actually was harder than I would have guessed it was it would be to do. So I started the book in 2015. That's when I set pen to paper for the very earliest story that I wrote. And the last story I finished around 2021, just before you know it went to print or whatever. Um, and in that time, a lot of things changed in my life. And I did find that I kind of like lost track of, lost touch with a little bit of the person I was when I was first writing those early ones. And so when I go back and reread it, I can see for sure differences in voice and like kind of differences in the perspective of the person who was doing the writing. Um, but I did try to do some things to like protect it and to preserve it. I developed some writing routines that would hopefully be kind of transporting. I would I would play the same music that I was early on. Um, I did a lot of rereading, which feels really narcissistic when you're doing it, but I would go back and I would just sit and reread stories right before I would start trying to work on drafting something else. Um, and I also, you know, I was doing a lot of reading of other people's short fiction. I had a few writers I was just really um, inspired by. And so one of them is someone named Lisa Taddeo, who is, among other things, a short story writer. And her short fiction is just like, for me, it's just so mind-blowingly fun. And I can just really feel the joy of writing when I read her work. Um, and so I would often start by just rereading a story of hers that I really liked and remembering, oh my gosh, like this is so much fun to do when you actually get to do it. And something about that would kind of like put me back in mind of where I was in those earlier freer days when I first started the stories. Um, but I would say that I also, because it's a collection and not a novel, gave myself and felt like I inherently had permission for the voice to change a little bit and for the stories to um, to exhibit different characters and to, and to not be so constrained to like one tone. I wanted some of them to be upbeat and others to be a little bit more downbeat and for there to be like different colors in the book. So I felt like that was okay too. Other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Um, thank you for reading this. It's so great to hear you talk about the book. Um, I'm here with a few undergrads um, who I'm teaching this semester, and we're talking about um, place in fiction and how, how important it is to locate stories um, and how that can be an important element of character and how it influences the way you see the world around you when you make that a, a sort of priority for yourself as a writer. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how place works in this book and how you, you know, despite the fact that these are stories, you know, you know, if they're connected stories, like despite the fact that they're connected, um, how you create individual settings for each of the stories and what is consistent about the setting you know, between the three stories. So the question in short is, you know, what's the role of place in the story? Um, how does it connect the stories together uh, and things like that? So I am a person who, when I am reading other people's work, I find that I, I do a little bit of skimming when I get to descriptions of setting often, but I always do really take away a lot of whatever I think, some, some key to what I think the feeling is. So if I see, for example, the term wood paneled, you know, my mind fills up with wood panels or whatever. Um, these stories are all set in the DC area, or for the most part, they are set there. And they all, uh, my agent mentioned at one point that like, it's a good idea to, to kind of like tie a collection someplace to, to some place to give like a sense of place so that the readers in that area can connect with it. Um, or probably so that readers can have like a sense of what the values of that place are, what the concerns of people in that place are. And so I did work really hard at making sure that there were, at the very least, references to parts of D.C., places in D.C. Um, but as far as on a more granular level, the actual settings of the story, um, I do a lot of pre-planning just kind of in my, my mind. And because, again, I don't have a lot of time to actually be sitting at a laptop at this point. I spend a lot of time just kind of like wandering around, like looking at stuff, thinking, oh, here, like this could happen, you know. And then sort of a scene will kind of start to develop in a place that I can see really well, sometimes because I'm either there or I'm in a place that I feel like is adjacent to it. And I think that even if, as I, as I don't feel that I do, even if you don't dedicate a lot of actual text space to 
closely describing place. I feel like if you can convey to the reader that there is a character to the place, that that will go a long way toward helping them to, you know, locate and identify what's what's kind of the character of the story. Yeah. Undergrads, I hope you're getting credit for this. <laughs> Other questions? I think that happened between stories two and three that I wrote chronologically. So I wrote that first, like really more like a vignette. Didn't you know? It's a short. It's really super short, and it doesn't move a lot in terms of plot. Um, but I wrote that story. That's the one that kind of harkens to girl, the one with the life lessons. Um, I wrote the second story. That one is a lot more conventionally set up, where there's sort of a you know a lot of exposition and there's sort of a plot arc. And then immediately I found that I wanted to keep writing about one of the central characters in that story, but I wanted to get close to her from a different angle. So uh, in the first story, so the second story that I wrote chronologically, um, she's being seen through the eyes of her son. Tony kind of talked about that, her sons. And then in the second story, I wanted her to be seen through the eyes of a sister because, again, like there's that really fun kaleidoscopic thing where every person is going to have a different perspective on the same character or events and then once that next story was finished I just like I think after that I never even considered not linking the next one to those other ones and that was at the point I think in my writing journey where I was starting to be told how to send work out and trying to get you know trying to find homes for the stories and realizing I could send them promiscuously everywhere that I wanted to and feeling like it was totally fine to keep writing about the same family because no one would know unless they just figured it out. And then also feeling like it would be really fun and rewarding if somebody noticed, which people started to. Um, and yeah, I think I I personally really love linked collections and I just like love those trap doors between stories and that satisfying, like I have figured something out here feeling. And so I got a lot of satisfaction and joy out of that puzzle of putting that together. Yeah, my favorite example of the multiple, uh, the, the different vantages describing the same thing is uh, Cassandra's dress, where she's like, oh, I picked the perfect, careful uh, dress for this occasion to cut the, the sort of professional yet, you know, center of attention look I want. And then from her niece's POV, it's just like she looks like an exploded raspberry. Yeah. More questions? Don't make me vamp. <laughs> Two more? Okay. Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, congratulations. Of course. I just wanted to say that. You mentioned that um, it was mentioned several times that you are a mother to young children. When your sons are old enough to read this book, what do you think they'll learn about you? Hmm. What do you think your sons will learn about you from your book? Oh, gosh, I can only hope that someday any one of them is interested in picking up this book. Uh, so I do hope that they will read it someday. And, you know, well, this is kind of a cheat answer, but more than anything else, I hope that they see, like, kind of that writing a book takes seeing something through and that there is there is a bit more to the process probably than what goes into reading a book. Um, so, so that's thing number one. But I also think that they're going to see, hopefully... Um, I find a lot of, I find that it's really interesting and really fun and can be like really intellectually nourishing to try to think very deeply about the feelings of other people and to try to have empathy for people whose perspectives, again, in many cases collide with my own. So a lot of the stories in this book kind of take like a little bit of an ironic perspective. So in many cases, I will uh, in many cases, the protagonist of the story is the person whose actions are like maybe the least defensible or who is doing something that the story is actually interrogating, you know, like maybe identifying as being not such good behavior. And I would love for my sons to adopt the interest in kind of seeing things from the unpo from the other side or whatever, and to trying to have like the grace of um, of of wondering at least what the people around them might be experiencing. Uh, which is something that I think a lot of people unfortunately don't do. Um, so yeah, but 
I also, so the book is dedicated to them. So I, I do hope that they, that they know that like I tried to write something that would entertain them at some point one day. So my hope is that one of them, there's three of them, I hope that one of them will read like one of the stories. <laughs> Well, speaking that of which, great, yeah. one of the, the characters in the book has shared as a name with w one of the yeah. people in the dedication, right, Miles? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was interested. I'm like, is that is that the one you were hope, hoping we'll read the one story? Uh, that would, that's it. Probably seems like the likeliest one. I, I know. Yeah, think, you yeah. you you called your shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. They well, so the story was written before our Miles was born, and so his parents, like like us, was going for jazz legends when they named some of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one more question. Go ahead. If you feel comfortable, could you share what you're working on next? What are you working on next? <laughs> of course, I would love I would love to share that. Um, so I do I while I love short stories like Till the Day I Die, and I think that they're so much fun to work in, and I don't think everyone needs to do this. I am working on a novel. That is an exciting thing that I have been um, interested in doing for a long time and that I think finally I have like the mental space to be able to finish it so because I have that security blanket feeling of not wanting to totally abandon characters I already feel that I know very well one of the central characters in company is the protagonist of my novel in progress which is which is um, so this is my agent by the way which is nearly finished <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah so the first draft the first draft of which I am feeling you know in turns like very proud and also very disgusted sometimes um, but yeah so that's the idea and again it's going to be something that explores themes of legacy and of um, generational tensions and of millennials really trying to do their best with what has been left to us in this heap um, but yeah, stay tuned for that. Shannon Sanders, everyone, give it up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Tony for moderating such a great conversation. And of course, thank you to Shannon for celebrating this launch with us. So just a few quick reminders before we wrap up. If you're still with us on the YouTube live stream, you can purchase a, a copy of Company by clicking the link in the live stream description. For those of you with us tonight, we have plenty of additional copies available for purchase at the register where you checked in. We also have a few copies of Tony's novel, Private Citizens, which is also about young people figuring things out in very different contexts. So I highly recommend checking that one out. Shannon will be around to sign and personalize your books. That's gonna happen at the little table alcove where my coworker Tiffany is greatly gesturing to. Um, we ask that you please grab all of your personal belongings, line up down the center aisle and curve around to the wall. Um, I believe that's it. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank, Thank you everyone. all so much again. Sure.